So I will propose to, to start. So I'd like to welcome uh, every participant, both in the room and in the virtual room. So this is a, a hybrid event, uh, both in Geneva, the Grad Institute, and uh, online. So I welcome all participants from uh, the different places, perhaps also from, uh, from Italy and from Lewis University. So this is this uh, Albert Hirschman Central Democracies Policy Seminar, uh, which is entitled Planning's, uh, Planning Europe's Future, the Making of the Recovery Plan. So we decided to take this opportunity of commenting on a very, very important uh, topic for Europe today on uh, the drafting of uh, European Recovery and Resilience Plan, which is a pioneering instrument based on the largest uh, long-term budget in the EU's history. So uh, I have with me today uh, two colleagues who are from Louis University in Rome, who joined us at Grad Institute in Geneva, and who are also colleagues in, uh, in a couple of research projects uh, that we're working on at the center. So I'd like to introduce, uh, you will see him in a minute, uh, Professor Luciano Monti, who is Professor of European Policies at Luis Guido Cali in Rome, where he has been teaching since 1999. He's the scientific co-director of the Bruno Visantini Foundation. Uh, Luciano is uh, our expert uh, in uh, uh, the, the field of European Union policies. He has been uh, uh, publishing over 100 publications on the topic, especially on the enhancement of human capital, in particular that of young people. Uh, he's also uh, uh, writing uh, several uh, policy briefs, and it's precisely on the two policy briefs that he has drafted in the course of the discussions in Italy on the recovery plan uh, that we would like to comment uh, today. So uh, the second speaker is uh, our colleague Anarita Cedia, who is researcher and who collaborates with the Bruno Visantini Foundation in Rome. Uh, she's also research assistant in the two uh, Swiss National Science Foundations projects that the center uh, is engaged in, which is uh, the puzzle of unspent funds, uh, the first project with uh, my colleague Deval Desai and Shalini uh, Randeria and reversing the gaze. Her work focuses on the use of EU funds towards strategic and local planning in Italy. She has been working on several projects developed by the Lewis uh, Business School in collaboration with the Italian Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Italian Agency for Cooperation and Development. So uh, we have the, the opportunity to have with us two speakers who have been uh, directly involved in the conversation and the broader debates in Italy on the recovery fund. And the, the presentation and the discussion today will uh, discuss those developments in Italy, but also put them in a broader European context. Because this, of course, has a number of implications uh, for the governance of Europe. And what we're looking also at is the, the, the use, actually, uh, of, of those funds at different levels. And we are very interested in the mechanisms of, of spending, uh, effectively spending EU funds, which is one of the aspects that we're working on in our research projects. So we have four big questions that the seminar will um, engage in. And I would leave directly uh, Professor Monti uh, to start his presentation. And uh, then we will have uh, uh, Anarita Cedia, and then uh, we will have the discussion with the audience. So this event is recorded, uh, and it will be available on the YouTube channel of the Albert Hirschman Center on Democracy. So you also have the possibility to uh, participate in the, in the discussion with the audio and the video activated during the meeting. And you can also use the chat function. So um, we are very keen on having your uh, participation in this event. So welcome again. And uh, I leave the floor to Luciano. Thanks a lot, Cristina. Uh, I'm really honored to be here also because exactly 30 years ago, I was a student of this uh, university. So for me, it's a very special occasion to come back to Geneva in my university. I attended here the Diploma de Tout Superior, uh, Droit International. 
it, so really, really very honored. Also, I am honored because this is an, an international contest where we can present a little bit the uh, Italian experience, that is a European experience in the pianification program and programming of the uh, next generation uh, EU plan that is, as uh, Christina said, Christine said, it's probably the hugest uh, uh, financial effort of Europe. Uh, uh, it probably will be unique in the history because we are dealing with a really high amount of, uh, of money. So I will just start ask to, um, to share the, the, our slides. OK. It's sharing. OK, fine. OK. So as uh, Christine said, uh, I will, uh, we will try uh, to answer to the four questions that Christine posed us. I will start uh, try to answer to the, f the, the, the first three questions. Then I will leave the floor to Anarita for a focus uh, on, the fo on the fourth uh, question. And when, then I will try to uh, conclude on the fourth one. So starting with the questions, just remember you, the first one is uh, which visions of Europe's social, economic, and environmental future has been expressed through these plans? So the first question is, what, what is behind this, uh, this uh, extraordinary European effort? The second question is how convergent are the priorities contained across member states' plans? This is an exercise of uh, <clears throat> comparison. So I will, we, I will just try to introduce you on some issues of possible comparison of the different uh, documents, uh, national documents. Obviously, um, due to the time, uh, we will not be able to answer, but just to give you some, you know, some, some suggestions for, for a discussion, clearly. Also because, you know, uh, the, the, the program has not been approved yet, eh? because uh, all member states, we presented the documents at the end of, uh, of May, and the European Commission has two, two months time to decide and evaluate the documents. So probably, we will have the documents approved at the end of this month, and probably we will enter into uh, the operations uh, at the end of the year. The, the first financial installment is, is forecast for, uh, I think, the, 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 the end of August. So we are really on, on the process. So that's it's, uh, very, um, so, so it's difficult to give answers. We can just fix some items and issues. Uh, the third question is concerning what are the challenges deriving from the multi-level governance of those funds? We are in, in the case of, of, obviously, this is a model of, uh, uh, of uh, multi-level governance, and Anarita will uh, get more, we focus on, on these uh, challenges. And then uh, the last one is uh, that I will try, I do not have any answer on, on, on this fourth one, obviously, <laughs> because it's a really hard, uh, it's a $1 million um, answer, but how to explain the difficulties to effectively spend the UA, uh, European Union funds in former programs. And now this is the problem of the problems, because the amount of money that Italy, Germany, France, and other countries has to uh, let's say a program and then spent into uh, for five years, but we have to to engage in two years and then we have time to spend. So it's a very short time. That's why we will see that to answer to this question, to, you have to go out of the financial aspects and you go, you have to go into the reform of the national system and and the reform of the um, multi-level governance. So it's not a financial problem, probably, it's not, but it's an administrative and legal problem and an institutional uh, framework problem. So if we start with the, the first question about the visions, uh, correctly, Christine, um, uh, she, she wrote visions and not vision. Because in fact, we have more than one vision that is uh, this is embedded into into the, the new experience, 
The first one is certainly the solidarity among countries. If uh, we uh, remember what uh, was the discussion about uh, before the COVID, uh, our member states were discussing about uh, maintaining or not the cap of 1% 1 and 1 of GDP contribution to the European Union balance sheet. So no solidarity. We, the, some countries as Germany, but, but we, we have to understand the Germany position because Germany is the, the, high, is the, the biggest uh, contributor to the European balance, but also Italy used to be a contributor. Contributor means that what you pay, what you pay to, the, to, to the European Union is more than what you receive. So we have some contributors and beneficiaries. I'm sorry if maybe I, I do some very plain things, but it's, you know I, I don't un understand. I know I don't know the people is hearing us uh, what kind of experience and knowledge they have about the European Union contest. So we have Italy, uh, France, Germany. We are we we used to be a net uh, contributor. Then we have net beneficiaries. Poland, for instance, Spain, you know, uh, Hungary, and. All the Eastern countries are net beneficiaries, so they received more than what they paid to the European Commission, um, the European Union. Um, so no solidarity. Uh, nobody uh, succeeded in discussing about euro bonds or, you know, try to share anything. It was really very hard. And I would say thanks to COVID, in this case, thanks to COVID, we, uh, 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 last year in June, in June and July, we decided to be more solidar between among us. Uh, so the first example is the recovery bonds. Uh, the European Commission, uh, we, uh, we uh, all countries ratified the next generation EU, that is the house, uh, the, the home of the uh, recovery uh, and resilience plan. So that is new SP, uh, instrument of seven, uh, seven, and, uh, seven, uh, seven and fifty hundred billion euro has been ratified by all governments uh, two or three weeks ago. Now the Commission is preparing the financial markets because now we have to go out with uh, this kind of bonds. And what is very interesting is that we have the, we had an experience, a previous experience last year concerning another European solidarity program, it is the program SURE. SURE is the program to help countries uh, mm, sustaining the, uh, well, I don't remember the, the, the Casa Integrazione Guadagni, which is uh, uh, the wage... Uh, yeah. Unemployment. Unemployment, the unemployment, uh, you know, where you, you have to, to, to maintain people. Uh, it's not unemployment, they, they are working, but not at work. Yeah. You know, they have to pay salaries to people uh, remaining at home uh, in all Europe, and we decided to share this experience, and uh, we, uh, pu we 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 published some euro bonds on that, and that was a very good experience because uh, the interest rate of that bonds uh, have been negative, so uh, the European Commission was able to collect money less than zero, so even more than. Uh, the, the EA, EAB or Germany bonds. So it's very triple uh, A bond. So we think that we will do the same in this case. So we will collect money on a negative base, then apply a very short commission and we be able then to return money uh, to countries uh, on a very, very slow uh, um, amount of interest, probably zero doc one, zero doc to 25. You think that Italy is, uh, is not Germany, you know, it, the, the, the German Bund is it's the best one in the, European, in the European market, but Italy or Spain, we have a very high interest. So we have to pay very high amount, you know, of, of money f just for interest. So thanks to this solidarity system. So recovery bonds, uh, the recovery in the next generation EU is partially uh, subsidized. Some of uh, Half of the of the subs of the program is a loan, but by the way, it's a loan, but it's a very low price loan. So we for for us it's it's a benefit. Even if an, it's a loan, it's very good because the, the, the rate is very is very low. So this is the first uh, uh, vision, a, a new vision, a new solidarity 
among countries. Then we have uh, the resilient model. For the first time, we uh, applied what is called the, the resilient transformation. Uh, this is a uh, well, this is a worldwide model, but we have a European model uh, developed by the Joint Research Center, JRC. They defined a specific model on that. And it's a model where you uh, have three aims. The first one is to try to protect the stock. And we have four, and this, this is, uh, okay, this model, I mean, the, the, the stock model is the World Bank stock, uh, this model, but has been applied to the GRC. And it's natural cap, so we have to protect uh, the stock. So the, you know that all capitals are formed by stock and interest, services. Money is uh, it, the amount of money produces some interest if it's, it's correctly invested. We can have uh, interest of the natural capital if uh, it's correctly uh, say invest. We say invest. We say if we we take care of our natural capital, the environment, we have ecosystem services that are the interest capital of the natural one. Then we have uh, human capital. Uh, the idea is that if we protect uh, young people, if we protect uh, unemployed people, we are sure that when, when, when they come back to the, to, to, in the labor market, they will produce interest. The interest are the labor activity, competitivity of, 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 of their own country, okay? Then we have social capital, uh, that is the, the, the major problem we, we had in this very hard time of COVID, you know, the, the, the restrictions. Uh, and we do not just think to people that they cannot go to the restaurant, but maybe uh, your, uh, your, your, our students you know, were, were forced to stay in a, in a, in a distance uh, um, activity. And then we have the built capital, that is the infra you know, material and immaterial infrastructure. So uh, ports, uh, 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 railways, uh, and then internet platforms and whatever. So the idea is that uh, we have to invest, uh, and thanks to these new funds uh, in all Europe, we have to invest uh, protecting this kind of four capitals, then try to uh, substitute uh, in, in, a, in a resilient way. So for instance, we have to accompany uh, the services into the what we call the two big uh, transformations, the digital one and the ecological one. So for instance, when we are dealing about uh, with interest in the labor market, the transition from the in-presence activity, then to the forced um, smart working, to the hybrid uh, system. M many companies in, in, in the, the, some of the national recovery and resilient plan, we have funds to uh, help companies, I mean, to encourage companies not to, to call back all the employees uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the physical office, but to maintain this kind of hybrid solution. But uh, uh, we have studies that uh, uh, there are mainly Ameri uh, American studies for the moment demonstrating that if you can, you know, uh, split from uh, the working, uh, smart working, agile working, to the, uh, to the work in presence, uh, it's, uh, the competitiveness of the company can, can ameliorate. So, uh, and also the, 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 the balance uh, uh, about uh, the balance um, among, um, of, of our life, you know, the working, uh, the working and commuting activity and our activity in the family or will ameliorate if we can uh, just. Uh, so the idea is not to go back to the previous, uh, uh, the, the pre-COVID situation, but in all Europe, but to, to enter into a new, a new, in a new way of working and uh, in a new way of balancing our uh, daily activity. And then also the resilience of outcomes, uh, well-being. The idea is to accompany, uh, to, it's an idea of dynamic well-being. So that is, for, for instance, uh, uh, a, lot, a lot of components of the PR, of the, uh, R, okay, we use the term RRP as resilience and, reco and recovery and resilience plans. 
So ARRP, many of the ARRP are dealing with this item. The idea is to help people maybe in the housing uh, in new forms of, mo of mobility, ecological mobility, uh, electrification, um, uh, electric networks uh, all around the county. So the idea is that we have to change our uh, lifestyle, accompany all European counties and citizens on a new way of, of living, a new way of also using, for instance, uh, um, the food. Uh, in, we have a lot of investment, uh, uh, funds to invest in what is, are called the strategical, uh, you know, the strategical um, um, production of, of, um, of, of, of goods. The idea is that all countries, all the, the European market has to have uh, uh, its own uh, production. So it's too risky to have production com coming from out of the continent. We, we, we realized that during the COVID that uh, the transportation where, you know, where, when you, 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 you stopped uh, the, the possibility you know, to, to, to exchange uh, goods uh, could be a problem. So the idea is that we, uh, we have to return, let's say, to the Roman vision. You, uh, uh, you know that during the Roman Empire, <laughs> Sicily was the, called the... Uh, Granaio d'Europa uh, was the, 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 the producer for all the empire of the, um, uh, some of the, the, uh, the, the basic uh, elements for food. Huh? So that, that, that is the, a new idea that we have to, profit, to, to, to use these uh, uh, five years to re redefine, redesign completely uh, a new life, uh, so also a new system of well-being for all, for all countries. Then, obviously, a circular economy, so we have to exchange our attitudes uh, in the uh, way we, we actually consider the waste, uh, so redefinition of a redesign of products in order to be um, easily uh, reintroduced into the process uh, to, uh, for what is called uh, the secondary material, and then consumption. Well, I, I, I could, sp I could uh, speak uh, two hours about this kind of model, but it's just to let you know that uh, behind uh, the RRP, there is this new vision of a uh, uh, resi of, of resilient model. Then we have uh, the, the last uh, one, uh, that is the Agenda 2030 embedment, as I told you before in my short introduction. And here we have the multidimensional approach. You know that uh, Agenda 2030 signed uh, in, uh, in New York uh, in 2015. Uh, they, uh, they changed the vision of the millennial goals into the new uh, 17 SDGs. And what we've done in the RRP is to exactly to, re to uh, uh, embed into that kind of vision the new system of the Agenda 2030. That is just not, you know, it's just not mm, dealing with the 17 uh, goals, but dealing with the idea of, of multidimensional approach. That means that if you take care of, of just one or two or just five of the SDGs, it's not enough. You have to take care of the 17 goals in, in the sa at the same time. So you have to wonder if you are, for instance, trying to protect the environment, if you do not lose on the job activity on the on the, on so uh, on on the other side you cannot develop uh, an industrial activity without respecting the environment so it's it's very complex idea that you probably know because that is a worldwide approach uh, the multidimensional approach of the agenda 2030 uh, that is you know uh, probably it is also one of the mantra of the new president of the european commission von der leyen when she uh, um, appointed the, the commissaires for the first time, and that was an Italian suggestion. Uh, all commissaires have also uh, at least one SDG as mission. So, for instance, the, um, the commissaire for uh, labor and social affairs, okay, you are the responsible also for the employment, uh, for the development of the goal number eight. So, all uh, commissaires or European commissaires have to every year they have to report to the president of the commission von der Leyen about the activity within 
the, 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 their single goals. And then uh, this is another very important uh, um, uh, result of the uh, embedment of the agenda 2030 is the foresight activity. What is the foresight activity? We start from the forecasting activity. So thanks to the uh, data analysis, obviously, we can uh, uh, define uh, some different scenarios for the future. In this case, future is uh, uh, 2026, because this is the deadline of our uh, RRPs. So we, uh, we, we obviously we have to uh, we can we can have we, we have on the table more than one scenario because it depends on the impact, for instance, of the COVID. If we will be out of the COVID now or not, so we have different scenarios. We chosen one of the best scenarios, obviously, not the disaster one. <laughs> And so we define a, a target, and the target of each of the component of the uh, in this is here of, of the component of the RRP is uh, we we have to uh, to write on on that component our target, and the target should be we choose the best scenario, and we we have to explain inside the documents how we can reach it. And as I told you before, we need always two types of, let's say, issues. The first one measures investments, so money, and then milestones, that is uh, reforms. So all, all components of the, our RFP are formed by the two uh, elements, milestones and reform, in order to reach the target that is one of the best scenarios Thanks to so that is the, the, the first time probably that uh, in Europe we try a foresight approach and not a forecast. Um, we tried a, a, let's, a little bit a, a foresight uh, approach uh, thanks to Agenda 2020 that it was the previous, but where we are no tools. I mean, you know, just say okay, we want to reach this 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 target, but now. We have uh, we have written exactly, and the Commission actually is evaluating all the path that all the countries in all the sectors in all the SDGs they declared to, and the Com European Commission will uh, monitor every six months that all components you are just doing one of that step of the milestones and measures. Then we have common rules. Uh, European social pillar, we uh, we introduced in 2017. Uh, for the first time, uh, we realized that Europe was not just, a, a, could not be just an economic experience, but must, uh, it must be a social one. So we introduced uh, the European social pillar, vo uh, voted in uh, Gothenburg. Um, I would honestly tell you that uh, before COVID, uh, this was just, uh, you know, on the paper, <laughs> on the paper. Now, uh, thanks to uh, one, thanks again, say to the experience of uh, of solidarity, we realized that, for instance, COVID has, uh, is had and has a different impact on population on, on on the population and on on territories. What is we call the asymmetric impact of COVID. So we have, for instance, uh, in in Italy, but also in Spain, also in, in say, all Mediterranean countries, the impact on young people, the impact on women is really, is worse, is, is higher. So we have to uh, protect, so that's why we have to apply as soon as possible all European social pillar to this kind of population, people that is, has been uh, economically and socially more affected by COVID, obviously, on the other side, on the sanitary health side, obviously the, the age of the people uh, over 65 years old uh, paid the highest price. So we have to introduce solidarity. And for instance, um, the, now we are discussing all about uh, the distribution of, of, uh, of the vaccine, for instance, you know, because uh, um, uh, not all people have been vaccinated yet. And there are some old people that has not been uh, vaccinated Goes to the fact that they do not have internet, so they were not able, for instance, to you know to to reserve the the, the vaccine. Um, so let's say that's uh, uh, one of the common rules we have to apply. The second one, 
is the uh, digital and green transition taxonomy. Uh, as I told you that we, we are dealing now with the challenge of accompanying economies to uh, the two the two digital and green transition. But uh, what is green transition? We have to avoid the greenwashing. Many companies say, "Okay, I'm, I am now a green activity." So the European Commission they published two what we call taxonomies. So they, it's a list of activities that are clearly recognized as green. So what is all activities that are not in that list, they are not green. And that is also important for the financial market to understand that you cannot just, you know, just to obtain funds from the, from the government or from or the, public, the private sector declaring that you are green. To be green, you have to enter into a particular list of activities, and that is the same for digital. <laughs> digital, no, not everything is digital. So we have to, so we published the, the two taxonomies, the list of activity that can be declared. And then we have the multi-governance model. We are today uh, dealing with this uh, item. Uh, this is not a new experience, obviously, because uh, the European experience is, uh, is a space of multi-governance, but now the difference is that we have a, really a, a huge amount of money and a really short time to apply. So the, now that is the item, that is the real challenge we have to face with. And then uh, uh, this is another very delicate um, item is the rules of law. Uh, that is the uh, rules of law in, for the European model is that you, you have to respect some pr general principle. First, you have to respect uh, the autonomy of the uh, ju judiciary uh, bodies. Second, you have to uh, 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 respect the uh, press uh, autonomy, so uh, people should be free to write whatever they like. And then you have uh, to respect uh, the minorities in your country. We applied this principle normally, we used to apply this principle that was uh, um, previously called the Copenhagen criteria. We used them to evaluate uh, the um, uh, accession request into to, uh, countries that wa wanted to join Europe. For instance, uh, uh, the, the Baltics uh, uh, had some problems to enter in, uh, in, the previous mo in the first moment to enter into the European Union because some of the Baltic Republic, uh, their attitude, I mean, their uh, relationship uh, within the, Ru the Russia minority, that w then it was a Russian minority inside their, ca their countries, was not respected in the view of uh, the European Commission. So we had to change some, some, some rules, some laws, in order to end to join in Europe. Uh, Turkey is still waiting uh, because they do not respect uh, the rules of law of Europe. But then the, the, new, the new aspect is that starting from 2020 and starting from this kind of funds, uh, now the rules of you is considered a conditionality to receive the money. And now this is the problem of Hungary and Poland. Because uh, when, uh, during the, uh, the, the, first examine, the first test in 2020, some of the aspects uh, has not been um, accepted concerning Hungary and Poland. And that was also the problem. Uh, at the end of last year, uh, Hungary and Poland said, OK, we are not ready to, to sign for recovery. And if we do not sign, everything was blocked, we'll risk to stop. So we decided not to apply this principle now, but in 24 years, uh, 24 months, sorry, after a pronunciation of the European Court. So actually, we are still reflecting on that. My personal idea uh, is that probably also Europe as to uh, when you compare, you have to enter uh, into also into the, the say the other countries' minds. I'm not so sure that Hungary and Poland are actually violated. Maybe let's say uh, I'm, I'm, I'm afraid to you know a bias. You know I'm afraid that maybe. We are just looking at and Hungary and Poland with uh, other eyes. If you look at, at the situation, so it's, I think it's correct that we take 24 months and we wait for the European 
um, a Supreme Court of Justice that will say if they are violating or not. I will not just trust the expert, the European expert going there and just you know make some interviews. Uh, it's a very delicate aspect. Uh, and, you know, in, if uh, Europe should be the Europe of tolerance, the Europe of liberty, uh, it's, this is very risky activity on the, on the philosophical and political aspect. I mean, just to declare what is the rules of law and what is not the rules of law. So this is, um, I'm not so, I mean, I will not sign tomorrow and say, okay, Poland is uh, violating all these rules of law. I would just wait for maybe negotiation also, you know, maybe they are ready to accept some comp elements or not, and, and uh, so this is really a, a very big team. Okay, uh, now uh, the results of all these uh, mm, missions uh, are the uh, recovery and resilience facility uh, that is, I remember you, is, is not the all the next generation EU, that is the entire program, inside the entire program there is the facility, uh, the facility is uh, more than 85% of the entire budget of the next generation EU, so it's, it's the main one. And uh, the European Commission, uh, the, 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 the regulation, uh, they divided uh, um, this facility into six priorities. The first one is green transition. The second one, and for the green transition, all countries has to uh, concentrate no less than 37% of the amount of the, of the budget, then 20% for digital transformation. Then we have economic cohesion, productivity, competitiveness, social and territorial cohesion, institutional resilience, that is mainly health, the fifth one, and then policies for the next generation. So. Trying to answer to um, the second question of Christine, uh, if you want to compare um, our, our plans, how convincing are the priorities contained across member states? Obviously, we have not time here to compare. We don't have time. We do not uh, actually have all instruments to compare, but just to give you two examples. The first one, for instance, is to compare and say, uh, how countries uh, respect uh, the, the, the structure of the, of the facility, Italy, for instance, is not respecting. Our document, uh, in the document, we are missing the last uh, pillar, uh, policies for the next generation is written in red. We do not have this pillar in our um, government. Personally, and Anna Rita and other, my co colleagues, we, uh, we animated the parliamentary debate in Italy on, on this. We, 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 we wrote documents for the Senate and, and, and the Parliament. We, we wrote a letter to the Premier uh, to say, listen, we, you, you, for, you forgot a pillar. They said, uh, uh, no time to change, uh, because you know that in Italy we had a change of government. Uh, we, uh, the, the, the previous government fought down exactly for this reason, for because of the, say, the parliament said that we, you are not able to, uh, to, go to, to define a good recovery plan, so you have to go home. A new government with Mr. Draghi, that you obviously you all know, uh, the, the previous uh, uh, president of the uh, Europe, uh, European uh, uh, Banca uh, Iber, uh, so I don't Central remember the, Central uh, Banca, Banca. Central Bank. The European Central Bank eh? is actually our premier. Well, he said uh, we cannot change uh, the, the structure of the previous government. We have to go on on that structure because we have no time. So we forgot. Obviously, we have some some uh, some elements that can be reconducted to the that pillar that uh, we can find uh, in other uh, in other pillar in other missions like education, research, inclusion, and cohesion. But this is the first way to compare it to verify uh, if uh, countries respect it or not uh, the pillars uh, suggested by the European Commission. I will, not, I will not say, I will just say suggested, so it's not a legal, it's not legal bound uh, element, but it was preferable to respect the structure, we didn't. Another way to compare, for instance, is to consider how uh, countries take care of the young generation because 
the facility is inside the next generation EU. So the idea is that we have to use funds to assure a better life uh, to the next generation. Uh, and here, for instance, this is what we did in the foundation, uh, Byzantine Foundation, this kind of, and this has been also the document that uh, was at the base of the parliamentary debate. Uh, here, what we did, uh, we compared, uh, we, we just put on, this, on these graphics, uh, the relation between the, uh, the uh, unemployment, the young unemployment index for each country with the uh, percentage of money uh, for, uh, reserved to young people into the RRP. We have some countries like Germany, uh, the, the box number two is the best one because in, in box number two, you have a countries with a very slow, very low, sorry, very low um, unemployment rate less than 5%, with a very high percentage of uh, uh, resources devoted to young policies, more than uh, almost 10%. So that is what is called a virtuous country. Then we are also a virtuous country in box number one, where you have Spain, because Spain, they face uh, with a very high um, unemployment, young unemployment rate, more than 20%, but they, they are devoting more than 12% of the, of the money to young policies. So it's, Italy could be a virtuous country if they accepted our proposal, but they didn't. So Italy now is with Greece, are in the, the worst box, the number four, where you face high uh, uh, unemployment rate and you devote a low uh, percentage of money. In the middle, you have France and Portugal, for instance, where you have, let's say, a medium, um, a medium high um, uh, the, uh, unemployment, young unemployment rate, and you have something like between 6 and 8% of the money devoted. So this is a way to compare. You, you cannot just compare the amount of money, but you have to relate the tools with the targets and, and, and the problems. So this is a way, obviously, you can do that for, for all other uh, um, uh, items. I, I, we just choose uh, the young generation because we used and we debate on the parliament about that. But obviously, a center can concentrate on other items, transportation, for instance, uh, or uh, um, health services. Uh, you, but you, you, you always have to uh, relate the amount of money with the entity of the problem you have to face into your own country. Then the second example, okay, this is just, uh, then inside the, 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 let's say, the young generation uh, package, we can also tell, uh, tell you about uh, how much is devoted to the labor market, about uh, is devoted to the social inclusion, education, upskilling, reskilling, self-employment. And uh, for instance, uh, you see that uh, Italy, uh, we do not devote it in the in, in the first um, um, in, in our in our RFP, We do not divide money to the labor market. That is 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 the problem. You see, France for instance is the orange uh, box, uh, the orange column. Uh, France for instance, they devoted money to the labor market. We didn't. Spain, as Italy, they do not. They just devoted money to the education. The education is very important, but we have to, you have to face with a very high uh, unemployment rate. You, you need also intervention and benefits for the labor market. And just then culture, and the second example, for instance, uh, we compare the Italy and France, and we can see how much money, for instance, uh, has been devoted to the, the digitalization of our uh, cultural heritage. And in Italy, we devoted 9% of the culture project. Uh, France, they didn't. On the other side, for instance, uh, uh, France devoted 22% of the money to the uh, creative and cultural uh, companies, firms. Why? Because, you know, the mo movies and media in France is, very, is a very important sector. It's not so important in Italy. So there is also always normally uh, a, a reason, you know, to invest money. But this is uh, just an example tell you another way to compare. Um, and then finally, 
I think, uh, okay, I think this is your side. Okay, I just give uh, the, you, uh, the floor to Anarita to try to answer to this uh, uh, other question, and then I will come uh, back with you for the final conclusion. Thank you for the moment, <laughs> and see you in a while. Good morning. Thank you to Christine Lutringer and Professor Monti for this occasion um, to discuss uh, this um, interesting topic. Um, here, okay. yes, we have uh, which are the learning experiences um, from the past um, program cycles and the multiannual financial framework and the new challenges from the multi level governance of those funds. Um, the key points of my presentation are those um, reported in this slide. So the relevance of the Italian case for the study of cohesion policy, the um, multi-level governance challenges and some of observations for, for Italy and uh, for Europe, but also uh, from Italy and from Europe. And um, as also requests some uh, concerns relating the socioeconomic situation uh, in Italy and in Europe. So uh, I just started to provide um, this picture uh, to recall the multi-level governance uh, uh, structure uh, defined as a dispersion of authorities from the center. So we have vertically the intergovernmental relations, there are horizontally the public and private relations. Um, here also reported a quote by uh, Robert Leonardi, um, who relates uh, this, uh, this framework, this scheme to the cohesion policy. So uh, the cohesion policy is based on a network system of actors, European, national, regional, local, and civil society representatives, uh, an interaction governed by a hierarchy of rules that gives way to a multi-level and a multi-actor governance structure. What really looks like is something like this. So we have for sure the axis, vertical and horizontal, they represent the same, the same things. So the um, uh, relations uh, um, between different level of authorities and uh, for diverse type of subjects, so public and private, but it's really fragmented and uh, interconnected in diverse ways. So for many years, academics and uh, um, other researchers as uh, have focused on uh, um, a particular topic of multilevel governance, so where decisions are taken and which are the spaces in which those decisions are discussed, um, if they follow a criteria of accountability and transparency. But another important uh, factor to include is where these decisions are implemented and how. Um, so there is a focus for sure on territorial jurisdiction uh, but also we have to explore the theme of this policy, uh, whether they are environmental for labor and so on and so forth. So just to provide some elements also to discuss later, uh, it is difficult in apply, difficulties in apply universalistic social protection and social health policy for several reasons. Uh, in the very first place, because at least for what concerns uh, Western countries and European countries, uh, nowadays the system of welfare depends on diverse factors, uh, namely uh, social and demographic changes, uh, financial and economic crises uh, before uh, uh, 2008 and 2010, and lately also due to the corona, uh, coronavirus, uh, but also how the relation among these structures have changed within and among them. Uh, namely state, family, market, and other intermediate bodies, associations, uh, or other bodies uh, uh, in the scheme of multilevel governance we just saw before. And also the change in the rationale for professional development. Uh, so especially for uh, those policies that are related to social care and social protections, uh, which is the logic for the allocation of HR staff, and to which uh, criteria they respond. So uh, we have seen um, the emergency of the uh, selectiveness and economic sustainability of those entities 
uh, that uh, try to face the need of social sustainability. But sometimes in reality, they are difficult to pursue at the same time. So we have, uh, just also to contextualize in the case of Italy, uh, and also to the uh, introduction of Professor Monti, um, reconducting these specific items of socioeconomic agenda uh, to the sustainable development goals. The situation in Italy is of uh, improvement of, in certain areas, uh, but for sure there are challenges that remain and are even severe after coronavirus crisis. Uh, for example, we have uh, uh, challenges, even though there are certain improvements in tertiary education for goal four, uh, we have a significant challenge to uh, the improvement of the uh, ISA score, uh, significant uh, gender gap for goal five, um, two uh, are indicators for goal eight, so Russia employment of the population and the um, uh, percentage of young people that are not in education either in work, so the need level. And uh, another severe challenge for Italy, but it is also shared for other countries that have a um, high rate of uh, elder population is the uh, elderly poverty rate. So after one life, of work, of uh, savings, of uh, also um, privation somehow, um, there see a uh, um, decrease in the um, in, in, in in the finances and in economic uh, um, uh, wealth they, they they used to have. Um, so, in the end, we have a demand of service, which is complex, diversified. And uh, it is uh, uh, diversified also uh, because there are divides uh, in the countries. So what, how to co connect uh, the multi-level governance, uh, the fact that we have a, 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 a diversified demand uh, of, uh, of needs, and the subsidiarity principle that is included in the European cohesion policy. Well, after the 80s, there is a, a strong focus on the regionalization of the cohesion policy and the fact that uh, the funds are allocated also looking at the, which kind of region we receive that fu those funds. And uh, uh, in Italy, we have experienced also a reform, a constitutional reform, so competencies um, at constitutional level with the reform of the Title V um, that uh, uh, recognize uh, uh, in the unitary of the Republic um, um, highest level of decentralization towards regions and local authorities uh, for the implementation of, uh, of services. Uh, so on the one hand, we have the recognition of the importance of these local and regional institutions uh, and uh, uh, also according to subsidiarity principles, so intervene at the level in which the authorities are nearer to the citizens. But at the same time, we have other several constraints, as for example, the resources that uh, also they have been uh, reshaped in the uh, um, um, balance sheet of, of uh, um, the diverse levels, but also for the fact that the states uh, continues to ensure basic level of those services. A typical example is the example of education. Um, but what happens here, not just in Italy, but in general, uh, for this, the, the, the simple fact that we assume there is a change for the ERC to a multi-level governance, is the fact that uh, even though uh, we have a division of uh, a dispersion of authorities, uh, there is still the shadow of, of the ERC mentioned also in the quote of Professor Renati that I reported in the very first, second slide. Um, in which there, there persists a system of hierarchy, even though we have a multi-level governance. And also a cross-cutting theme is the fact that uh, uh, we should maybe focus uh, and enlarge the uh, multi-level governance framework, including other elements. So for many years, we have focused on where, so the spatial co-constructive space in which uh, decisions are discussed and taken, uh, maybe the same discussion of co-constructivism should be applied on time. So there is a famous book also of a physician, Italian physician, it is Carlo Rovelli. So it is the, um, uh, the dealing about time. And he's saying, well, uh, we have to start to discuss whether it makes sense to ask uh, what time is it on Mars or what time is it 
in another part of the planet? Well, the same kind of question should be addressed in the multi-level governance framework. So what time is it for that administration or for this administration involved in this kind of team, uh, since it is somehow co-constructed? Uh, and also time is a key variable for understanding how policy is delivered uh, and uh, uh, how it is uh, uh, effective somehow to deal to uh, to deal with uh, uh, different type of, uh, um, of of shocks that can be of different degrees so low medium or high just to uh, uh, reconnect to the uh, JRC uh, resilient moment that the professor uh, the professor quoted uh, uh, before the time of exposure, of exposure that can um, uh, drastically change the way in which uh, the issue is uh, solved or remains there, because there are processes that uh, um, uh, somehow lock uh, the problems, so define it, uh, close it, and it is very, very difficult to intervene once uh, that, pro that process is closed, and also require more efforts. I would add. So identify also which time of action are needed, the prevention, preparation, protection, promotion, and eventually transformation. Uh, just to give an idea of the perception on time and how the policy evolves uh, in different moments that are different from the moment uh, um, uh, foreseen in the multiannual financial framework. Uh, this is um, an image is taken from a report of the European Court of Auditors. Uh, we have the multiannual financial framework, which uh, represented by the red line, the years at the very base of the horizontal axis of the, of the graphs, and the red part represents the expenditure. While we have the expenditures linked to uh, normative aspects and legal aspects that have been promoted by the European institutions, and then other types of uh, uh, activities and objectives pursued by the European Union, so namely the Paris Agreement or the uh, already quoted objective of sustainable development. So, indeed, there are other things that it intervenes within the same uh, uh, multi-annual financial framework. And they somehow, um, we have to explore how much, intervene also in the way uh, the policy are delivered across the level and the, um, the actors of, uh, in the multi-level uh, multi governance. So, which are the challenges eventually? Uh, the bottleneck, for sure. So uh, where there are overlapping or uh, it is different, difficult to organize the activities, uh, where are the gaps? Because if you remember in the uh, um, graph that I try to, <laughs> to pick here, uh, there are spaces among levels. And it means there are gaps that at the moment has to be further explored because uh, there are not fully formalized or there are uh, intervening factors that are not already consolidated. So how the various actors deal with that and how to bridge uh, parts in which a vacuum or a gap occurs. And then ask what type of problems uh, we are dealing in the frame of multi-level governance. So there are easy problem and complex problem. This is a very... Um, easy way to put it, but uh, the easy problems are those in which uh, when the action is taken and implemented, uh, there is a, a clear divergence uh, from the path before the implementation of the policy. So it is clear the result, uh, if it is effective or not. Well, complex problems uh, uh, um, uh, have a phase in which uh, the output of the, pro uh, the, the achievement of the result uh, is not immediately clear. And this and the, the time <laughs> that we consider for, for this delay may play a role also for the future de decisions. And also explore what really means sustainability and resilient. Because sometimes implement uh, um, resilient uh, scheme require unsustainable uh, efforts in terms of uh, human resources that works on projects, in terms of uh, huge amount of re financial resources that um, uh, have to push to transform an organization or um, uh, a system. 
and also look at the process of dispersion of responsibility, as well as the creation and consolidation of new partnership, which has been another topic uh, for several academics. So just trying to uh, arrive to uh, certain also key points here, um, there are many challenges uh, of multi-level governance. It also depends on the type of entity, a body we are looking at. So there be for private uh, entities, for public entities. There are, of course, also for administrators and institutions, which somehow have been also the main beneficiaries of the uh, president uh, um, in current multi-annual financial framework. Um, but the, the, the thing that we have to remember is that uh, uh, it is important to focus on those kind of entities because they represent uh, what we call generally also on the philosophical point of view institutions created for the uh, for reducing the cost of transaction, so to facilitate the organization of individuals uh, that rationalize resources and restore the respect of agreements. Um, they are basically composed by four elements, structure, human resources, system and tools, and overall governance. Uh, what we have um, observed during the current multiannual financial framework is that the structure uh, can evolve during the time. Uh, we have relations among ministries, regions, and other bodies, uh, which are in part uh, uh, set up by the regulation of the European Union uh, that define the managers, authorities, and intermediate bodies. But there are indeed other types of intermediate bodies that uh, um, uh, may play a role, uh, even informally, in the discussion about the topics. Uh, so when we look at the structure, we used to uh, identify uh, just the essential components, but indeed the, the picture is, uh, is larger than that. The human resources is a very key factor uh, that it, it has uh, objects also of attention during the current multi-annual financial framework, uh, beside the system and tools that we are going to see in a while. Uh, the situation in Italy, but also shared in other European countries, we have to, to say, is the high staff turnover rates and uh, a significant uh, digital divide within the countries and within the regions uh, in urban and rural context. And uh, the need expressed clearly in the uh, self-evaluation assessment of HR and uh, the need to develop ways in which uh, tasks and uh, organizational needs are formulated to improve uh, the, um, uh, the, 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 the performance of the administration and to improve also uh, the achievement of the results. Um, here, uh, the third component is systems and tools. We have to admit that um, uh, Italy represents uh, several best practices in the um, collection and organization of data. Uh, we have uh, the experience of open question, but there are other uh, data sets that are very useful to academics and uh, researchers, um, as for example, uh, the uh, Conti Pubblici Territoriali, but also uh, the uh, National Register of State Aids that uh, um, um, is strictly connected to uh, the one of the European um, of the European uh, of the European Commission, but uh, um, it is. Uh, uh, um, uh, sometimes, uh, somehow, uh, it enlarges uh, the action of the European Commission portal as well. And then we have, of course, the uh, other data set of the um, uh, Ministry of Economic and Finance. They answer basically on three uh, fundamental requirements, which are technical and functional, informative, and communicate. But how uh, the question here, once we have the um, uh, the, 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 the we have noticed that there are these good practices, uh, is uh, uh, how to uh, spread the use of these uh, uh, best practices um, that we can also further discuss later. Uh, and then the overall governance, which is particularly important and it was also a, a theme in the axis of an operative program devoted to that. Um, um, we have experienced a change in the previous, uh, so it is a learning experience that we have, uh, the organization at local level through um, 
um, contractualization at, in uh, of local um, authorities, uh, parte di sviluppo or uh, piani di sviluppo, um, that uh, 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 try to uh, manage this uh, um, uh, fast decentralization from the center. But then we have another problem, which is the public and private partnership and private pri uh, private relations uh, that uh, especially in the uh, multi-annual financial framework 2007-2013 um, uh, uh, prove a weakness in collecting preferences and elaborating feasible proposal. But there have been some improvements in this one. So it, it seems that uh, from one multi-annual financial framework to the other, uh, the, um, the experiences are collected and rationalized. Uh, another uh, key moment is the mid-level uh, um, evaluation um, uh, of the European Commission in 2018, um, which have uh, uh, stressed the importance of uh, um, uh, focusing on the, for sure, of indicator of a financial expenditure, but also indicator of results. So some observation from these uh, studies conducted, uh, there are elements of strength. Uh, yes, there are. Uh, so the inclusion of stakeholders uh, with respect to the previous MFF, um, the um, looking for homogeneous administrative capacity, it was also one of the objective of this uh, um, program cycle, and uh, the presence of scientific committee and experts that surely enlarge the debate on the issues. But there are weaknesses that persist uh, that are also depending on the mega trends uh, that are intervening um, in society, as for example, digitalization. And uh, uh, this is particularly true, for example, in those areas in which a digital divide exists and persists, and the fact that it has to be covered uh, the delay in the application of the, prog of the previous prog program cycle of intervention, intervention in certain issues. And uh, another th theme that should be explored more is the complexity of proliferation of norms and so how legislation and civil ser servants communicate. So uh, just to conclude the very last slides, uh, um, uh, there are uh, uh, surely um, a connection among the experiences of the cohesion policy in Italy. Um, and some of them uh, have been uh, representing the moment of discussion of the um, next uh, program cycle um, in 2019. So the fact that uh, there is a need of uh, um, explore a, a taxonomy uh, for the um, 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 transfer of best practices uh, that, sh however, should focus on organization and individual competencies. So there is already a focus on what is needed. It is deriving from the um, um, uh, self-assessment uh, for administration. Um, a very positive experience and also another theme that should be explored more, the socialization of difficulties among administrations and civil servants, uh, because it is a, a moment in which uh, difficulties are not seen as weaknesses and are not seen uh, as a way to judge uh, the performance uh, of the uh, individuals or organizations, but are a moment in which the attention is focused in a problem-solving setting. And at uh, that moment, the consolidation of that kind of socialization allows us to set uh, different questions uh, in the moment in which the problem is solved. And the theme we have already uh, covered is the coordination that uh, intervenes not just where intervenes the coordination, but also when. And this is example for when we have national agencies and uh, regional agencies that might share um, a competence or fields, so um, it could be also explored more. So uh, we have just to wrap up something that is already said, so I'll cut short here. Um, the co-construction of meaning, of time, of, of course. And uh, something that is more a warning than other is the fact that uh, uh, there is uh, the risk uh, of uh, misinterpretation of novelty of innovation. So uh, focus on what the new regulation and new rulements uh, will, would include and how effectively it is implemented at the local level, we determine 
uh, if it is a novelty or is it is uh, effectively innovating. And uh, the fact that uh, um, in multi-level governance, uh, there is this golden rule that is optimization. So decentralize uh, and uh, centralize when necessary and decentralize whenever possible. But it also has to be uh, questioned in these specific local contexts. And so also comparative analysis is extremely useful to understand how general golden rules and general principles apply and how they, the, the concrete cases can give something also to the theory. And uh, having taken even uh, much time that it was required indeed, I will just uh, um, leave the floor to Professor Monti that uh, will uh, conclude his, uh, his speech. And uh, I, of course, uh, thank you all and uh, waiting for uh, your questions. Thank you, Analita. Uh, just two words <clears throat> okay, to find, uh, to, to reach a conclusion, um, then just a couple of slides. Okay, now I think the problem is uh, how, what, what it could be the lesson for, let's say, uh, even going out of Europe and say, try to, 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 to reach a conclusion. I think the conclusion is that uh, when we try to apply the multi level governance to a resilience model, we realize that uh, we have uh, two big problems. We, uh, and I think Anarita uh, correctly explained uh, these two problems. The first one is time. Because uh, even if uh, uh, we are dealing with uh, multi annual programs, the emergency, like the COVID emergency, demonstrated us that timing is very important. Timing, time to, uh, to have a vaccine, time to help companies, time to help workers. You cannot wo uh, help uh, unemployed workers in two years. They, get, they, they need uh, food uh, in, in one month, in one, in one week. So you, you need to intervene as soon as possible. So probably the first problem is certainly timing. We try and, when you apply that kind of model, you have to have clear in mind that timing is very important. The second, the second one is the risk of overlapping or lack of competence, so the so-called canning state. So if, even in, in, this, in case of resilience model, you need to define as soon as possible who is responsible of that particular component. So just to conclude on a couple of slides, that are coming out of the uh, project that um, Christine is managing. Um, the, uh, okay. If uh, we uh, just uh, have a look on the why, uh, why we have a low uh, uh, impact of resources in the past, um, Anaita explained us the experience, uh, uh, told us about the experience of uh, uh, 2014 and 2020, uh, we have four, uh, areas, problematic areas. The, the first one is unspent resources. We are not able, when, and when I say we, uh, we're not speaking about Italy, normally about a country that has to manage a, a huge amount of money or an important amount of money. So we have a problem of unspent resources. Then we have the problem of unspent delays. Once again, time. Because if we use the money correctly during the period, but not exactly in that mo the moment where, when we, we, we face with a crisis, it's a problem. If you, if, you have co if you help companies two years later, probably you will just help bankruptcy, uh, you know, the court of, of bankruptcy and not the, the entrepreneur because the entrepreneur has already, you know, go into bankruptcy. Then we have a misleading use of resources. And that is the case uh, when we use uh, uh, public money or we use uh, European money to face uh, to local uh, emergencies, we um, maybe, uh, uh, and this is pro it's, it's a problem because you need always to respect the uh, the regional uh, goal, the SDG. So we have to respect why we we put some money, we we share some money in Europe to obtain a certain objective and not another one. And then that is another very important problem 
is the low target achievement that is, deal, is dealing with the indicators. We have a lack of ind indicators. We, we need to develop more in, in all Europe, uh, a local indicator or a generational indicator, more data concerning, for instance, women, more data con uh, concerning young people. Uh, we have some data. Obviously, we have data concerning job activities, but maybe certainly we do not have data, for instance, for bank accounts or for loans or for other um, life aspects um, of, of the citizens. And then just, just to conclude, uh, the idea is that when we face this kind of four uh, areas, problematic areas, we have also to look for the primary causes, and you have seen here in the this prospect, it's not so easy to go to the roots of the problematic tree. And just to conclude to, with an example on the, I think the first, uh, okay, unspent resources, why we can have unspent resources, we have three um, causes, inefficient governance, administrative constraints, and extreme high number of committed projects. But once again, we have to go to the roots, why we have inefficient governance? Because we have, maybe we have a lack of coordination between authorities, or uh, lack of coordination or no coordination, the, uh, the, the canning state, or lack of, or lack of long-term programming affected by political instability. It depends also of the stability of the government. It depends if in that, in that, in that uh, country you have a spoil system. In Italy, we have a spoil system, a minister, has the chance to change all the, the, the top uh, managers of, of the minister. It's a very good idea, but it could be a, 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 worse, a, a very bad idea if you, you need, I mean, you, then you need the time to people be able to, to manage again you know, a, a, new, a new activity. So if you, if you do not have time changing all the, 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 the government, it's not a good idea. Then you have a lack of political affinity. Maybe a, the regional um, administration is, a, is, an oppos is a, an opposite party of the government. So it's a difficult dialogue. Then excessive of, uh, use of in-house bodies or improper use of technical assistance and consultants. It's another big problem. And then we can go and see all the other aspects, but I think we will share then the slides so you can find the analysis for each of the four big items. So I think that's, uh, the time is over for me, and uh, I thank you very much, and I leave the floor again to Christine. Thank you. Can we make it? Yeah. Um, we can go to three of us there. Oh, okay. And let's take the Anita to join. So thank you so much, Luciano and Anita, for this very, very informative uh, presentation. I think uh, it's really interesting to, to know also the, kind of the different levels at which one should consider the policy-related decisions. So we have heard about the national level, member states, Italy, and the European level. But it's also very interesting to go through, I would say, the chain of uh, uh, implementation, but also co-design of projects. So I think this is really the richness of, of this work that uh, you have been doing. And I think this is also what we would like to explore in this research policy seminar. So really the juncture between uh, academic kind of uh, uh, analysis and also the practical implications. So we are now in this ongoing debate about the European Recovery Plan, and uh, it was important also to contextualize and also to, to put this into the broader kind of pathways that European Europeans and EU has been undertaking. So uh, we have possibility to take questions both from the room and online. So my uh, colleague Laura, whom I thank uh, also uh, to support us. Uh, is Laura able to uh, hear us and also possibly let us know if there are other questions from the, the virtual room? I can hear you. Other, you. Yes, and I recommend that if there's questions also from the audience online, you can maybe turn your camera on and ask it, ask it directly as well. As of right now, I don't see any uh, raised hands. 
Okay, perfect. So I'd like to seize this opportunity to ask a question. Because um, we have been uh, also very uh, interested in, uh, in following your involvement uh, through the policy briefs. And you mentioned, Shadow, that the policy briefs uh, that you wrote was, was discussed in the, in the Senate. So how, I mean, my, my question from an outsider, uh, outside from this connection between the, uh, the, the, the political and academic room, how does one manage to get its policy, her or his own policy brief into the, the parliament? Okay, uh, you have two uh, possibilities, uh, a direct one and an indirect one. In this, uh, sometimes that is not that case, uh, we are invited as professors to explain to the commissions, uh, say, when I say commissions, I say the parliamentary commissions, but obviously I think also you have the same here, I say, so you have culture commission, public affairs commission, employment commission, social commission. So as professor, you can be invited to explain or try to uh, clarify to parliament. For instance, I remember in, uh, in 2000, when uh, Italy has to vote in favor of the enlargement of Europe to the Eastern countries, they named the three professors to uh, uh, animate the debate uh, at parliamentary level. I was one of the, of the three. The second one was Lucio Caraccio, that is actually a geopolitician, so was a, an expert of, of European enlargement, and I was at that time. Uh, and uh, professor of geopolitics, and the third one was the general director of our statistic uh, office. So in that case, you are invited, you have just, you know, the chance to uh, present uh, normally some written um, papers, and then you have to answer to questions coming from the parliamentaries. In that case, uh, it was a, a more structure, uh, structured um, uh, environment framework uh, there, uh, Byzantine Foundation has an agreement uh, with one of the of the bureau of the presidency. Uh, it's called the Consiglio Nazionale Giovani, so it's uh, the advisory body inside the government uh, dealing with responsible to give advice to the government, the parliament concerning young policies. We, as foundation and the university, we have a pro bono activity uh, framework, so we we uh, support them for free. You know, uh, it's what certainly you saw, you saw, you saw today was in Geneva, it's called the third mission of the university. So in that, we are, we are acting as third mission. So for free, we help the government to, we give advice to the government for free. Uh, so in, and in that case, my team, Marita and other people, we have been involved uh, in, in, with this cap. So we enter into the parliament as experts of the uh, advisory body of the, of the presidency dealing with the young people. And so we had uh, trying to create the, the pillars. And luckily, we, we didn't succeed, but we tried to do that. But this, we, we succeeded in doing very important. OK, we, uh, and luckily, we didn't obtain uh, the pillar. But we, uh, we helped the parliament to increase the amount of their budget for young people for 1 billion euro. So in the, in the final governance, uh, uh, it's called the governance decree, so it has been published uh, last week, the government decided to increase uh, the, the amount of money for young people for 1 billion. And that is a success of the advisory council and a little bit also a success of us, of, of the researchers. So it's a very, uh, very, uh, let's say, uh, it's, it's an, it, 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 I think for, for us researchers, for you, it's very important some, somehow to try to see if your research can have a practical uh, result. In this case, you know, the result has been the awareness of the parliament about a problem and the way to solve the problem. And we succeeded in obtaining more money for, for our young generation. Thank you. I see there is a question in the virtual room. Uh, Velibor, uh, our colleague who is uh, head of research at the Global Governance Center at the Broad Institute. Hi. Uh, I'm guessing you can hear me OK, yeah? Yes. Yeah, great. Sure. Yeah, thank you for the, for the presentation. And, uh, and as Christine said, I really appreciate this format as well, connecting the 
uh, the sort of uh, scholarly scientific with, with the policy. I think it's important and very useful for our students and, and I guess beyond with the international Geneva community here. Um, I have just very, one question, I guess a bit of a conceptual question. Um, when I was engaging a little bit many years ago now with the EU studies uh, literature, um, specifically the this concept of multi-level governance, I always understood that as, as a bit of a critique on the role of the nation states in even international relations, let's say more broadly. Um, and then at the same time, at the beginning of this, uh, of this presentation, we were talking about national experiences. And now even at the end, we're talking about these discussions that are taking place in a national um, deliberative body. So my question is to what extent, uh, is this a critique of multi-level multi governance? Does it actually not work in practice? Or is it uh, is there more to the to the story that that, that maybe it just needs to be uh, made more explicit or that I didn't catch, uh, i.e., other actors were involved in the Italian uh, preparation of the national plan, for instance. So I'm just wondering where is the the connection between the the national story and the multi level governance story, if I've understood both concepts correctly. And Arita, would you like to to take it first, uh, if I may? Sure. So in the first first place, thank you for the. Uh, this comment and this question, uh, which is because it expressly underlines uh, how indeed this two concept concept of CEU both. So we are first we are first to uh, nation states and to uh, states in general, uh, but also to different kinds of levels uh, according to which type of actions we are dealing with. So I think there is not a consistency. Uh, in the reality of things. But this is what I observe uh, from my perspective. And uh, but it is important uh, to present both the situation uh, to see what indeed works and what it is, is in theory. So we adopt this uh, kind of two perspectives uh, also to spot uh, in which case uh, certain concepts are obligated in which they are not. So for sure, the narrative of multilevel governance uh, should be explored more in a, uh, also in the, in the um, uh, let's say, in the in collection of case studies uh, to be also compared to the, uh, the, 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 the nation state one. Would you like to also elaborate on that? No, well, uh, just to add, just to add something, you are, you are correct. I mean, uh, we are dealing with two uh, different contexts. Even uh, the multilevel governance is different. I mean, um, when we deal with the uh, multi-annual financial framework, uh, we are dealing with uh, the model is called the decentralized model. Okay. Now with the uh, recovery plan, we have a direct model. So it's it's, it's different governance, obviously. But the, the, the trade union between the two are certainly the, fact, the relevance of time. As I told you, uh, as I told before, they say we, if we have a problem of time, if, if we have a problem of governance in, uh, let's say, a simplified model of the multi annual financial framework, we, can, we are afraid that this kind of problem will be enlarged in the more complex system of the recovery plan that is a direct, it's a direct European Commission program managed on the multi-level governance and the multi-level governance is a new governance approved last week. So we, we, we because in, 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 the, in, the, in the document, uh, we do not have the governance because the government said we do not have time now to define the governance, we, they waited one month. And just last week, uh, we send it to the Commission also the governance package. So the new thing, the, also the fact that it's so, uh, you are right. I mean, we, you cannot exactly compare the two uh, experience, but certainly the problem of the first one, and Narita was concentrating on, certainly will be come out also in, in this new governance. That's why we are so worried <laughs> about uh, say the time problem and the, uh, the kind of state problem that is also the linkage with the project of your institute. In fact, where we try to connect the lessons learned or to be learned from the previous programming cycles to this new program, which is also much broader as you have described it. 
Is there any other comments either in the room or uh, yes? Um, Maria and then Jerome. Uh, just uh, like to ask if there, there is a valuation procedure foreseen for uh, for the recovery fund, how much if the funds will be, uh, where, the, where the funds will go directly, uh, if there is mismanagement, because in the past we have seen many instances of misspending uh, in some countries. Uh, very, very, uh, very good question. And luckily, we cannot answer in five minutes on, on this question. The problem of evaluation is the problem of indicators. So, uh, for the first time, using the 2030 uh, framework into the recovery and resilience plan, uh, in the, in the, not in the documents, but into the uh, let's say online platform because the government has to fill also on like uh, online templates for each component for each investment you have to define all governments had to define an indicator one indicator then you have to define a baseline so the tendency of that indicator during the time without no with no intervention state intervention and then you have to calculate the target that should be a quantitative target concerning investment. For the evaluation of the reforms, uh, we have milestones. So you have to indicate the timing. So for each reform, all governments had to, for, to fill a template. And in the template is written first semester 21, second semester 21, there's uh, first semester 22, 23, 24. And for each semester, you have to indicate, for instance, uh, uh, now, okay, we present it to the uh, culture commission, then we present it to the uh, um, parliamentary session, or we introduce uh, a decree uh, uh, law, or we introduce uh, a regulation. It's very precise for the first time, I, I, I would say, it's very precise, it's very uh, strong uh, uh, method of evaluation. We start from the indicators, as is, it must be, because to evaluate afterwards is difficult if you do not have data. And uh, so all Europeans now are actually using the same system, the same indicators. The problem, as I told you before, is the local indicators. We are not prepared to manage at local level, and we and uh, remember that concerning Italy. Uh, 80% uh, of the money will be spent at the local level, thanks also to the national governance of Italy with the autonomy of regions, and maybe in France is different. But in Italy, it's 80% of the money will be managed by local authorities. We do not add data. So it's exactly what actually we are doing to the say to the government, and we, uh, we write papers on that. Pay attention to the indicators, pay attention to data. If we, we do not have data, no evaluation, or you have to make an evaluation, and then presume a national level, then presume an impact on local level. Very dangerous activity. I mean, it's not a scientific one. Thank you all for um, I mean, very good question. Very, very <laughs> we need one week to yes. discuss about that, but it's just now on, on the field now. Uh, Jerome, you. you had a question or comment? Um, yeah, thank you very much for your presentations. Um, uh, I just have a quick comment and, and um, um, maybe a question. Um, the first one is concerning timing. I think indeed timing is a, an extremely relevant um, criteria, especially if we consider, for example, um, environmental questions such as climate change that can span over uh, a large um, time frame um, versus technology, which uh, the evolution is extremely fast and extremely rapid. Uh, but my question was more in terms of capacity building. I, I, I'm, my question is um, when the, mo the money will be delivered at the national and local level, um, will the local um, administration be also uh, trained uh, to not only receive this money, but also, um, I want to say, some kind of capacity building or raising awareness about environmental questions, for example, or technical questions or technological questions. Um, because if, if, as you mentioned, everything is spent at the local level, um, I do, I would expect that 
if we want to have a strong impact, uh, we need to have also um, local officials who actually see the benefit of this strategy and understand this strategy and not just apply or receive the money for whatever reasons. Thank you. Would you like to go first, Anita, and then Lucian over the also conclusion? Yes. yes. Um, thank you. Um, both for the comment and for the question. Um, I particularly appreciate the fact that you combine environmental technologies. Uh, extremely uh, interesting uh, type of argument here. Um, uh, there, for capacity building, uh, in Italy there has been uh, the experience of 2007-2015 uh, over the program, and then uh, another one in during 2014 and 2020. And there has been a, a strong efforts of different national agencies, uh, both for cohesion policy and for thematic uh, um, issues, as for example, uh, an energy and environmental uh, issue, to uh, somehow share practices and uh, uh, raise awareness in uh, administrations at the different levels. So we have the uh, national one, but different from the uh, thematic uh, agencies, uh, then we have regions, and then we have the local authorities and other um, other local authorities at very local level. Um, so, of course, they have implemented uh, different uh, projects uh, in different territories that are taking into account the homogeneous uh, um, capacity of the administration to be put in the project. As uh, I would say, a first a feasible step uh, when you have to set up uh, this kind of uh, uh, operations. Uh, the difficulties is to spot where uh, there are divergences, so where there are difficulties in which local authorities uh, to spot the gap, and also to find uh, the uh, type of awareness campaign of the type of project uh, to raise the awareness and achieve the results there. Because we say that the cohesion policy is a very useful uh, frame of policy, it can implement and produce uh, interesting output, but at the same time, there are other, and here yeah, I also recall the comment of the expression of the um, uh, previous uh, speaker, is that um, uh, there are national policies as well uh, for the administrative enforcement, uh, and so here the question is how to um, uh, frame uh, the, uh, the different interventions because there are not just the lack of awareness, there is also, and in general here I would, I would express corruption, uh, there are uh, um, exogenous shocks that intervene so local administrations as for example earthquakes or uh, and so on and so forth. Um, so here to say there are good uh, best practices to uh, build a systemic uh, um, uh, actions for the local authority enforcement. Uh, but you know, it is uh, a question of uh, which kind of awareness uh, and which type of, competen of competencies uh, to transfer. And this is very complex thing to do, I would uh, like to add. Luciani, would you say a word of I, conclusion? Yes, of... No, I will be not so diplomatic as Anarita, <laughs> and we say we are not prepared. <laughs> we are not prepared. That's why. Uh, once again, a university will be called, in this case, to the first mission. So we are, for instance, we and all other universities in Italy, we are preparing syllabus and programs for public health servants. Myself, I'm already, already involved in courses. To, tomorrow, tomorrow, I have a course for, for instance, um, uh, municipalities. So I have people coming from municipalities online, luckily. But we are doing that, and I will spend June and July courses and courses of all levels. So that is really a national effort. For all universities, most of these programs are for free. So we, we are, we say, contributing to, to, to this challenge for our country. And so, but we, honestly, we are not so prepared, really prepared. We have good, good experience in the past. Uh, Manarita mentioned that a program, a specific program to do that. But at that moment, uh, the timing was different. Now, we, we need a, uh, just a, uh, one week ago, the government decided to employ new 
I think something like uh, two, uh, it's a concourse for yeah, five, uh, yeah. five, uh, five thousand people, young people, for the trial for uh, the judiciary system. Because then we have a problem with with those justice. Because one of the condition conditionality is the reform of justice, and that is really complex. But we have never succeeded in doing that in twenty years. Now we have to do that in twenty in twenty four months. So. Honestly, we are not prepared. We are doing our best to, to face the situation. Thank you very, very much uh, to, to both of you for this extremely interesting topical um, discussion and, and information uh, that you have given us. And I think it's also very also interesting to see which role researchers, like university students, can, can play in those, uh, in those processes. So thank you very much for joining. Thank you. For the audience, uh, thank you, thank you to the audience in the room for joining. Thank you uh, to the audience online, and uh, we are looking forward to seeing you in our next talks and events. Thank you, and bye bye. Thank you. Thank you.